Deutsch weiter. Okay, I will continue in German. So once again, a very warm welcome to this online presentation of the Encoder report golden bullet or a worsening crisis new dependencies on synthetic fertilizers and their consequences for the african continent whose author is dr gillian tops for those of you who speak english today uh, an english language version of this study report will also be available as of end of august currently we can see more than clearly how the different crises including climate crisis corona wars and the world food crisis <coughs> Um, exacerbate each other. FAO uh, published the number of uh, people in famine in 2021 again. Uh, so a new increase to 828 million people of people in starvation. So the consequences of the Russian war and aggression on Ukraine have not been uh, reflected this yet. So the number of people that are affected by insecure food supply can still increase dramatically this year. And synthetic uh, fertilizers play a crucial here, role here, as our study shows that if this affects, in particular, the food price crisis. And currently, the fertilizer industry is generating enormous profits, especially on the African continent. Um, fertilizer manufacturers have increased their profits and their sales uh, extremely the last 15 or 20 years, and they keep stressing that they that we absolutely need synthetic fertilizers to, to uh, feed the world increasingly. Apart from the role of synthetic uh, fertilizers in the current price and food crisis globally, we'll also find out today about the development of the use of fertilizers on the African continent and the consequences uh, for smallhold farmers in particular. At the same time, we will hear concrete suggestions in terms of where politics can become active and what the alternatives might be to extensive use, the extensive use of mineral fertilizers. I'm now just going to present today's agenda. First of all, Dr. Jidian Tups will present the central outcomes of the study. Jidian Tups uh, um, has carried out research in the economy and uh, has, has a PhD on uh, the American market. Uh, the analysis of new uh, supply chains and fertilizers that he's focused on. And then afterwards, my colleague, Lena Wasserman, also responsible for food, uh, global food and agriculture in Kota, um, speak about requests to politics in terms of crisis-resistant food system. Um, we have an alliance for a green revolution in Africa and the concept of uh, agriculture, alternative agriculture. After that, after Lena, Audrey Darko will be uh, welcomed. I hope she's joined us now. Audrey has founded the company Sabon Sake. It produces organic fertilizers, and together with farmers, they fight for a climate resilient agriculture. It, in the second section of today's event, we will uh, um, collect your questions you, you can submit your questions at any time using the q a tool in writing and we will then forward them to the panelists accordingly so having said that i'd like to plus the, pass the floor to gideon tops now thank you ever so much let me share my slide can you see it can you see my slide yes excellent yes thank you lena for the introduction and thank you to the entire Encota team for the excellent cooperation in the run-up of the last few months and of course thank you to all of you watching and listening today i really look forward to uh, presenting the study i'm the main author so it's great for me and i will really use the structure of this study to orientate myself we've got five chapters in this study and those chapters basically reflect the objective of the study as well i.e in the study we start with a general description of sustainability and dependency issues linked to the use of synthetic fertilizers and then we have two rather analytical um, chapters one in terms of the dynamics in the global fertilizer industry and one on new marketing practices within africa 
in the fourth chapter, uh, which kind of was an outcome that only produced itself during uh, the production of the study. In that uh, chapter, we will look at the global pricing crisis for fertilizers and the implications for African farmers. And in the final chapter, uh, which will not be presented by myself today, but by Lena, we have um, political recommendations and demands. Let's start with the central role of fertilizers in the global food crisis. As a matter of principle, you can say that nitrogen fertilizers in particular have increasingly dominated the global food system since the end of the uh, Second World War. They've really fueled that system. You can see a study here that's not presented of our report, but it's quoted and it's a graph here. And this is just hard data today. Half of all agricultural yield is directly dependent on nitrogen fertilizers. That affects all the food items that we eat, also the ones that we waste, that we don't use, that we use for biofuel that is then burned, that we feed to animals and so forth. Nitrogen fertilizers actually help us to maintain a very inefficient food system globally. The increasing use of synthetic fertilizers um, goes hand in hand with a uh, high in environmental impact. That's a large matter of criticism. First of all, there's a, an extremely high energy requirement um, involved in the production and transport of those fertilizers. So nitrogen uh, uh, fertilizers need fuels like uh, oil, natural gas, and even uh, uh, coal. When they're used in agriculture, synthetic um, fertilizers support the emission of climate um, uh, nitrous oxide, which is very harmful for the environment. And generally speaking, you can see this here uh, in the third part graph again, it's not part of the study. The use of uh, nitrogen and phosphate uh, fertilizers leads to an exceeding of planetary boundaries for these um, compounds. In excess of this environmental problem, and that's something that's surprisingly uh, discussed much less, the use of the synthetic fertilizers also uh, is linked to socioeconomic dependencies. What you can see here uh, is an overview of the last 25 years. And what you can see is how the prices of energy, oil, gas, and coal um, are really linked to synthetic um, fertilizer, um, nitrogen fertilizers, and food prices. So when energy costs increases, shortly that nitrogen fertilizer and food will become more expensive. So a study, uh, so the, the, the crisis uh, of 2000, 2007 and 2008 was studied and it's shown that doubling the fertilizer prices will lead to an increase in food prices globally of about 44%. So fertilizers are now clearly linked with the pricing of food items. So that really underlines this high degree of dependency uh, of our global food system. So what you can say uh, as an interim wrap up, basically the synthetic fertilizers are a, a foundation of the global food system. Dependency problems and economic dependencies uh, question the centrality of synthetic fertilizers increasingly, increase, uh, increasingly. A climate friendly food system definitely needs to make do with fewer synthetic fertilizers. And this is a, mu a new momentum really Uh, with geopolitical tensions, new socioeconomic dependencies and risks are created, which were uh, not uh, discussed enough at all in the past and are really acute now. In the second chapter of the study, we focus on the global fertilizer industry and in particular on their dynamics. This is a field that's pretty unknown as well. 
not, not many people know how they're produced and, and uh, marketed and sold. You can say, generally speaking, in the last 20 to 25 years, the global fertilizer industry has undergone a rapid transition. There are two major trends here. The first one is a, a clear tendency to privatization. So formerly uh, uh, state-run fertilizer companies or cooperatives that made fertil fertilizers that were not for profit are increasingly privatized, are listed on the stock exchange, and then they have a high profit pressure afterwards. So they need to get high um, share prices. They need to uh, ensure that dividends um, are passed on to shareholders. So they need to make profit, basically, big profit. And apart from that, apart from the trend to privatization, you can see a tendency towards consolidation. You can see on the right hand side, uh, the right hand side here, uh, which you can look at in detail later on, maybe. This consolidation, this tendency basically means a logic of grow or go. That means larger multinationals keep buying, acquiring smaller companies, and then they're merging uh, with larger companies as well. So we have a, uh, more monopolies increasingly globally and locally in terms of fertilizing fertilizers in the companies. So what are the implications of two, these two major tendencies? First of all, if we just look at the actual fertilizers, you can see that this formerly strategic resource, which was to do with the independence of national or regional in, uh, independence, uh, it's now become a profitable uh, good. So companies uh, distribute them based on market demand and no longer any, any government uh, strategics. So for the market, that means we have a restraint offer, uh, supply, and more market power from larger multinationals. So fewer providers, uh, more demand. And within the industry, it uh, brings a very high expansion pressure. It means you have to grow, and growing means selling more fertilizers in order to uh, generate the profits that are expected of you as a company. Now, looking at the global fertilizer use, uh, you can see that the fertilizer industry has been facing a major issue for several years now, which is the fact that on the one hand side, the physical limits of the use of fertilizers have been reached or even been exceeded. So that means more fertilizer will not make more money. At the same time, uh, currently very uh, topical in Europe, but also in China, there are string, uh, more stringent, more strict environmental regulations, which uh, uh, mean that there's a restricted use. So that means historically, the, the established markets for fertilizers are no longer a fertile field for, for this industry. So Africa, as a consequence, uh, uh, takes up a very specific position because in Africa, the use of these fertilizers is much less frequent. And within the fertilizer industry, the hope now is that you can establish yourself on that challenging market to expand even further. It would be the last chance to expand globally in Africa. So again, that means what we can say as an interim consequence, the, the global fertilizer industry is, is in rapid change. Privatization creates a high pressure for growth. And that means that we have fewer multinationals that dominate larger markets. And Africa is the last future market for this industry. In the third chapter of the report, we focus on this actual focus, uh, sorry, future market, uh, to kind of show the history, what's happened in these markets within Africa. And this kind of is where the title from the study comes from, because within the last year, so it started in the early 2000s, where you had more demands for a fast green revolution within Africa. And the idea then came up is that fertilizers could be this golden bullet. Increasingly, that the idea was uh, promoted politically. It was put up high on the agenda coming from fertilizer companies, 
uh, given political meaning. And, uh, and the current president of the African Development Bank, he used to be uh, the regional leader of the Rockefeller Foundation, so Akin Womi Adesina, he said that some have said that fertilizer is not a silver bullet. So he acknowledges that fertilizers are very controversial, but he also goes on to say they're right. It's not, in my view, it is a golden bullet. So he really crowns um, um, fertilizers as the one and only solution. This quote dates from the African Green Revolution Conference in Oslo in 2006 in Norway. Interestingly, it was organized by a large fertilizer producer. And that conference took place to prepare the African Fertilizer Summit in, in Algeria, in, in Abuja, which led to the very important Abuja Declaration. The Abuja Declaration um, stipulates that members of the African Union uh, to increase their use of fertilizers from eight at the time to 50 kilograms per hectare um, hectare of, of, of land that can be used for farming. So a high focus now on fertilizers all of a sudden. Now, this focus and this approach in agricultural development is not quite as new as you might think. We can present this here using a graph that shows the fertilizer use in Africa dating back to the 1970s across history. And what we can see, the state subsidies for fertilizers was something in post-colonial Africa with the new young African governments. It was tested then, and then it failed dramatically. So at the end of the 1970s, we had another global oil crisis, which also led to a food crisis at the time. And in African states, it often also led to a fiscal crisis so, uh, so all these programs, subsidies, and so forth for the production of fertilizers has crashed, and the fertilizer use just decreases um, abruptly. The new subvention or subsidy programs that were then re reinitiated um, from 2010 onwards were promoted with, with the fact that they wouldn't allegedly make the same mistakes again because they would be accompanied by public-private uh, partnerships. So they really waged that there would be partnerships between African states, actors within uh, foreign aid, but also the fertilizer industry, and that that would lead to a sustained uh, increase of fertilizer use. The findings or the results of this last subsidy wave from 2010 to 2016, however, are very sobering. Here I can um, talk about the excellent ENCOTA study by Timothy Wise, and there are also other quantitative and qualitative studies about the subject. In general, all studies are uh, have found that this was not very effective. So what are the main points that are mentioned are that there is a high stress on public budget budgets concerning uh, often more than 50% of agricultural budgets. Also, uh, the improvement of yield for small peasants have been very low or have not been existent at all, which is a huge problem. And of course, there are a lot of reasons for this. For example, um, access to water or to nutrients, so a lot of problems. And another further element that I found very important is that if subsidies subsidies reach small peasants uh, led to a social differentiation on the local level. That means 
the um, marginalized farmers have not been reached, but those farmers who have been reached are those that already profited from fertilizers and could improve their standing even more. So there is a inequality on the micro level that was furthered by these subsidies. So now what are the effects of the last subsidy wave on the fertilizer industry? This is something that we go into detail in the study and we have this uh, graphic here, which is based on my own um, research. So we can see two organizations and supply chains on African fertilizer markets. On the left side, in uh, red, you can see the classic fertilizers and the market-based supply chain. So we have a lot of single corporations and actors that compete on the global market and who distribute via different actors in the country to um, uh, to small farmers, for example. So this uh, market-based supply chain model in the recent years has been competing uh, due to public-private partnerships with the vertically integrated leaf, um, supply chains. So here we have really multinational fertilizer corporations who entered the market, who de the market where corporations uh, delivered and then uh, quitted, but here they really distribute uh, along the whole supply chain and uh, control it. So this is actually also called a vertical monopolization that has happened here. Such vertically uh, integrated supply chains serve uh, multinational agricultural corporations. Uh, first of all, the direct marketing, but also uh, they um, uh, further conventional agricultural practices. So uh, partnerships with local elites, uh, etc. support the monopolizing of chain uh, supply chains, which happens on a massive scale on the village level. So this creates a uh, competitive advantage within the industry vis-a-vis -vis the local industry, so that, which would be the market-based uh, supply chain, which is more and more marginalized. So I have another interim conclusion. The expensive subsidies for fertilizer have um, failed in the past in Africa. Multinational fertilizer corporations are the last to have been the last to benefit from the latest um, subsidy wave and uh, fertilizer corporations have an increasing market power in Africa and they influence the agricultural development and which agricultural models are um, considered the most important. So the chapter where we talk about the global um, price crisis um, focuses on the African end market. So these are some preliminary results. We are now in the southern part of the globe, which is where the uh, season, the planting season is just starting. So we just have to wait. So we have looked at the last two years. We did have a high increase in fertilizer prices in 2022 due to the COVID pandemic. There were um, strategic export uh, stops from Russia and from China in order to protect local um, or domestic agriculture. So there were less fertilizers available on the world market. At that time, we thought that prices would recover soon as soon as supply chains recovered and everything should go back to normal. 
since uh, the Russian aggression uh, and the war on Ukraine, we observe a price explosion. And among experts, there is almost no hope to a recovery in uh, in the medium run. So probably uh, the prices, the fertilizer prices will uh, stall at this level, which is something that we know in Germany from natural gas. So um, we have uh, acute fears that there will be a, a year long food crisis, not only a small shock, but this was something that has to be taken serious. African markets are heavily affected by the sanctions concerning Russian and Belarusian exports. You can see on the right side, the part of Russian exports in Africa is relatively high compared to other big uh, agricultural regions. And also the relative purchasing power of African farmers is uh, pretty low compared to other agricultural regions. So the risk of demand destruction is very high. So that means that the farmers say we cannot afford any fertilizers this year. This is a very acute risk. And therefore, despite a relatively low use of fertilizers, African um, farmers are very highly exposed to this risk. What role does the um, fertilizer industry play in the crisis? Nina already mentioned it. We um, show in our study the uh, benefits from the first uh, quarter of 2022 compared to the first quarter in 2022. We do have uh, an increase of up to double from the double uh, up to the seven times uh, the benefits. So these uh, corporations are really, really profit from the crisis again, because 2000 eight during the crisis, these corporations already profited highly from it because of the oligopoly uh, structures. We know it from the uh, German debate around the, concerning the mineral oil tax, a very quick reaction, and which was also my first reaction, was the demand or thinking about uh, subsidies. But these uh, numbers show very clearly that subsidies uh, would risk to increase um, benefits for corporations instead of benefiting uh, to farmers. And I think we have to have this debate and Lena will go further into it. So, an interim conclusion and the conclusion of my part is that African farmers have a high dependence um, due to geopolitical risks, so a high dependency on synthetic fertilizers. And uh, demands for new um, fertilizer subsidies should be taken carefully and the risk is also increased that acutely affected farmers will not be reached by these subsidies instead there could be a subsidy spiral in the long run subsidies um, entrench systemic risks which we know from previous crises and they prevent alternatives, and I hand over the floor with that. Thank you very much, Gideon, for this great overview of our study. I will now hand the floor to my colleague, Lena Bassermann, 
who will go further into detail on the demands uh, towards politics that we concluded from our study. And after that, Audrey Darko from Ghana will talk about alternatives, possible alternatives, in order to reduce dependencies on synthetic fertilizers. I will use uh, this time where we share the slides to tell you that you as listeners are invited to uh, pose your questions already now using the question and answer tool. You can use that at any time. And I think there will probably a lot of interesting questions about Gideon's presentation. You can just type them in now and then we will collect them and ask them later. And then hand over the floor to Lena. Thank you very much, Lena, and thank you very much, Gideon, for presenting the findings. Now I will talk about demands, recommendations that you will also find at the end of the study. And uh, our demands for political decision makers and the federal government of Germany. So our study finds that uh, structural dependencies in the agriculture of fossil fuels, uh, fossil energy, and synthetic fertilizers has to be reduced urgently. And this conclusion um, is something that was supported by the report of the FAO that was uh, presented yesterday about um, hunger, about hunger in the world, where they mentioned that a price increase of fossil energy and also prices of synthetic fertilizers can be expected, which leads to higher food prices. The FAO also recognizes that uh, reducing the dependency on chemical fertilizers by various means can increase um, soil healthy and um, improves uh, food. So they have recognized the positive ecological aspects and also uh, the aspects on the healthy nutrition. I think this um, publication is something that uh, supports our findings from our study. At the end of our report, we uh, summarized our demands and because of what Gideon just presented, we um, observe the price developments and of the food crisis, um, which should, which is really necessary. So it should be monitored closely. And so this is a analysis um, so that we can monitor the political measures. And so there is something that is discussed concerning mineral oil uh, corporations. And we think that an ex excess profit tax also for fertilizer companies is something that is possible. There are German corporations in this industry or that have uh, manufacturing uh, sites also in Germany. And we think that introducing such a tax would be uh, useful. And we showed in our study that they benefit from the crisis, which is not right, and which has to be um, taken into account. Uh, there could also be a price cap, which is uh, actually um, discussed about mineral oil companies and the fertilizer corporations show in their um, benefit reports that the increasing uh, that actually their benefits go further than just uh, mitigating increasing energy and transportation prices. And we have to say clearly that this is not possible. Uh, measures have to be taken from the government because this leads to the fact that crisis uh, aids for farmers 
uh, mean a indirect uh, subsidy uh, of corporations, which is not good. We uh, fear, which has uh, rather already been mentioned, and we would like to uh, stress this uh, more clearly that the crisis and the current measures that are being discussed could um, lead to a return to subsidies for synthetic fertilizers, which should be should really be um, uh, not take place from our point of view, because vulnerable farmers would not have any possible to uh, improve their sustainable situation. Uh, the German federal government excluded this for German farmers, but we fear that with project for um, developmental aid, this could uh, happen and this could be uh, a measure taking place in the crisis. A lot of countries in the Global South see this very critical because uh, during COVID, we already observed that a lot of people um, are indebted and if uh, or a, a lot of uh, state budgets are indebted and this issue could ex increase and then they don't have any money for social measures. So uh, one measurement that we suggest is um, organizing a crisis fund that we can see in other international organizations like at the FIO, uh, which can also um, introduce alternatives uh, in the crisis, for example, organic fertilizers for farmers and agroecological um, advice for farmers. And we think that crisis solutions should go into this direction to think about um, these alternatives and also social security is one very important factor that is dependent on um, these imports and uh, which should really be increased from our point of view. Of course, we also thought about midterm demands. Um, we think this opportunity should be used for a stronger um, agricultural and ecological transformation. Uh, so we think the uh, funding of green revolution programs should be stopped. I mean, these public-private partnerships have been mentioned, and this is a demand we've been voicing for a while. I think it's been proven clearly that these programs are neither sustainable uh, nor have any um, uh, financial benefits. On the opposite, on the contrary, they lead to more debts amongst farmers they're just not crisis resilient at all and just not um, able to kind of uh, mitigate these shocks there should be much more financial and political support for holistic systems um, for the production within close nutrient cycles yes and agro ecological alternatives should be made available it also includes the extension of agroecological ex um, um, advice services. So, farm exchange, for instance. So, we need an extension of advisory networks, and funds need to be made available for that advice to be able to be passed on. And then the last point is to strengthen local and regional marketing networks so what was presented before in the study report um, there was a strong push after the the last world food crisis in 2007-2008 i.e a push to integrate smallhold farmers in these systems as well with these green revolution programs and in our view that uh, was a major flop it didn't work out at all and this this the this strong dependency on export on import on both sides uh, is something that shows in the current crisis how important it is to have local and regional marketing networks that need to be strengthened so it's not just a, a matter of production but also a matter of strengthening all these marketing 
or go to market networks. So that was it from me. And I'd like to pass the floor back to Lena. And I'd like to also encourage everybody again to um, ask you questions within the Q&A function. Yes, please go ahead and ask questions. And next, I would like to ask Audrey to turn on a camera. I don't know whether, Audrey, you're sharing a presentation slides. We'd really love to hear from you, your work in Ghana, how you produce organic fertilizers and how you work with farmers as well, and what uh, the re response to the current crisis is like over there. Audrey, can you hear us? And can you activate camera and microphone? Yeah. Audrey, yes. Yeah, uh, Audrey, yes. Uh, right. Um, all right. I want to share my screen. Sehr gut. Okay. Can you also turn your camera Audrey? Das Could you also please turn on your camera, Audrey, so we can see you? Yes, hello, Audrey. Nice to have you. There we go. Can you see my screen? Hello. Yeah, that sieht sehr good out, Audrey. Um, yes, that looks very good. Maybe you can go on full screen in the slides, and maybe if it's all possible, you could wear a headset because the sound is very poor. Bitte. Yeah. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Um, my name is Audrey Estarku, and I am currently in Ghana. Um, I am the lead at Saban Sake. Um, what we are is a regenerated agriculture company um, that focuses on rural um, farming communities to promote regenerative agriculture, improve their soil health, um, and then provide training and workshops for farming communities um, to grow and um, build build um, climate resilience yes, for, uh, for, for um, the shocks that come within um, the industry. I would say that, um, so I'm Audrey Estaku, I'm here representing farmers. I'm a farmer myself. Um, I grow vegetable crops, um, specifically like green pepper. Um, we also have soya bean um, and the likes. And I'm as well um, here representing um, organic fertilizer manufacturers. Um, and, and that's what we do at South and Sake. So today I would briefly like to share um, a few ch challenges, um, small scale farmers in Ghana, which is a country in the Western part of Africa um, and how hardly hit and how hardly impacted um, due to the fertilizer prices that have increased over time. So today I'm, today I'm presenting um, our, our approach, which is a regenerative agriculture approach and um, our local organic fertilizer production as a climate resilient and grassroots response. I'll quickly touch on the problem and say that um, over 65% of soils um, and land across Sub-Saharan Africa are degraded. And this means that um, most of them are depleted with, with soil nutrients. And because of that, it, it has a serious impact on how um, food is grown and also the price of food, because when you have soils that are degraded, you're not able to have the yields that are necessary to, to be able to support and supply to the markets. I'd like to give a bit of context and focus on Ghana, um, although this is quite um, replicable in other African countries or across the continent. So Ghana um, is, um, is situated within um, uh, Fran Francophone landscapes um, by Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, and Togo. And it's um, an Anglophone country. So, um, majority of the people speak English. 
Um, and at current, we are the largest importer of fertilizer um, in West Africa. And specifically, almost all the, all the fertilizer that comes into the country is, is nearly 100% um, synthetic or chemical based. Um, aside that, Ghana is an agrarian society where a majority of the population are into agriculture and it's almost like the second contributor of gross domestic product or GDP for Ghana. Crops like cassava, rice, maize um, and other high value horticulture products are grown. And you'd have farmers on average having about less than two hectares you know, for planting season. So a few things, um, a few features of like farmers within the Ghanaian market are that um, at current 80% of the, of the fertilizer market within the country is subsidized by the government. Um, but at current you would find out that it's not as extensive as um, it probably was years ago. Um, and also with the nutrient deficit, we've, we've improved a bit from about eight kilograms um, nutrients per hectare as of you know a decade ago to about 20 kilograms nutrients per hectare as of 2019. But you find out that most of the farmers are situated in the rural areas um, and they are the and they are the bread basket for a lot of the um, a lot of the inhabitants within the capital cities. And it's important that you know if they are well resourced with um, sole inputs that allow them to increase their production, it, it has, a, has a huge impact on how food is distributed across um, the country. I'll just go into the challenges and say that annually we have about a 50% deficit um, shortage of farm inputs and fertilizer inputs. It's quite sad that majority of this is imported and brought to the shores of Ghana. And currently, um, prices of fertilizer have quadrupled. Um, um, a few years ago, about two years and a year ago, um, we currently had about a 25 um, kilogram, 50 kilogram bag that was being sold for about 150 Ghana CDs. Um, but now it's currently about 400 to 450 Ghana CDs. And that's almost quadrupled. Farmers, really have low purchasing power across board within the country and that makes us price sensitive. Also with the nearly 100% imported um, chemical fertilizers you realize that um, there's, there's, low, um, there's low focus on local domestic production of organic fertilizers. So because of that you find a lot of the farmers either planting without these um, soil nutrients that are needed to increase yields or you know, at best now are resorting to a do-it-yourself approach where they would put together a few organic materials and basically um, produce food for the soil in order for their plants to grow. So Ghana's potential and even Africa's potential currently is for, for yields is currently about 24%, where um, we are, our, our yields are currently around 24%. And we have an, a, an even more better potential to grow more yields, right? But when you, when you don't have access or the, you don't have enough access or availability of these whole inputs, of course, your yields um, would decline and, and that's not good for um, the citizens of the country. Another major thing that um, is occurring in Ghana and it's a huge challenge uh, across board for farmers is the fact that Whenever you, whenever prices of um, fuel, diesel, petrol increase, immediately food prices increase. And um, that affects the prices of other commodities, both food and non-food commodities. And that definitely, definitely puts fertilizer um, in that bracket. So at the moment, it's really hard to even find access to fertilizer and even have the money as well or income to be able to purchase this as consistently as possible. So currently the government has put together a Saturday program um, that could support um, farmers 
farmers across board to grow food, you know, better their soils and all that, but it's it's not fully extensive. And mo most of the, the subsidies are, are focused on, you know, chemical products because the consumption for, um, the consumption and availability of organic um, and domestically uh, produced fertilizer is, is on the low. Lastly, um, I'll, I'll touch on the fact that um, climate change has really exacerbated or worsened, um, you know, the issue of, of the rise in fertilizer prices. Because um, aside the price being increased, you have issues of drought. Um, most of the countries within Ghana, countries in, on the continent, um, are rain-fed. Um, are dependent on rain-fed agriculture, so they're dependent on the rain to grow food. And currently, with you know an increase in drought-prone zones, um, not just in Ghana and the northern parts of Ghana, you realize that uh, there's a need to kind of support and nurture the soils in order to um, grow food. So, what role do we play in boosting the fertilizer market for farmers? Simply, Saban Saki comes in. To um, as sustainable local manufacturers of organic fertilizer to increase the accessibility and to increase the availability um, of organic fertilizers. What we do and the approach that we've adopted is to situate ourselves within the local communities, so the local farming communities. We recognize communities that have um, abundant, um, ab have resources, right, that they'll normally call waste um, and then Tap, it, tap into that uh, resource and then convert that into organic fertilizers that are accessible to them at low cost and discounted prices um, and at a more frequent basis. So um, at the moment, we are making use of sugarcane waste um, and a lot of rice waste as well. Um, that would normally be burnt, that would normally be dumped um, and left to waste converting that using um, clean technology and then producing uh, what we call our Sabantara organic fertilizers that supply within the districts and the communities um, in close radius to the production house. So over there, um, that's one of our local interventions. And we've realized that making sure we are situated within the community allows um, farmers within the community to understand what it means you know, to produce inputs, one, um, understand the need for organic and its positive impact on the land, because it's not only about uh, the availability of fertilizer, but what is the impact of that fertilizer on your land and how, um, how long lasting is it, right? So, um, in terms of availability, availability, we're producing this on a sustainable basis and partnering with um, agro waste producing communities. The second thing that we're doing and we've been focusing on um, has been to nurture and networks of farmers, which we call regenerative farmers. So these farmers, we feel, um, require education. They require consistent sensitization. Um, of the need to not just apply, you know, soil products on their land, but basically understand what it means to sustainably manage their land, how they could, for instance, mulch in order to um, reduce drought and keep their soils well moisted, um, as well as being aware of what's happening within the climate and how best they can prepare for that. So we put this two together um, within farm communities in Ghana in order to champion organic um, food production and as well um, empower them and equip them uh, regardless of what's going on within the fertilizer market to be able to stand and then produce food that is quality and food that is nutrient dense. So, um, this is just a, some pictures of us extracting the waste um, from sugarcane processing mills and turning it into um, our organic soil fertilizer. These are also some of our product lines. Um, these, this is our regenerative farm um, demonstration where we have farmers come to our our demonstration farm and see how from the scratch to finish, 
we apply everything organic, nothing synthetic, and are still able to produce, you know, in good quantities, um, nutrient dense um, vegetables for them to produce and then um, increase their income with. So I'd like to end there and say that um, we at South and Sake, we're, we're really excited that, it, excited that we can use this opportunity, right? Which might be in code, somebody would say it's a curse, um, what's happening within the fertilizer market, but we feel that it's also an opportunity and a blessing to actually um, tap into the opportunity and get farmers to be aware that you know, going organic, going sustainable in their land management practices and um, taking care of their soils, taking care of what they apply to their land for um, increased yields is the best way to go. So even though they might not have the money to pay for um, what they used to buy, maybe chemical fertilizer, now is the time to go back to um, being more um, sensitive about the environment and being more um, understanding of, um, of of their soils and the biodiversity in order to in order to still plant, still have a, a good livelihood, and then still increase production. So um, I would end here and say um, I had a few recommendations, but um, I think I've highlighted that. Um, in, in my prior submission. Um, and I'd say that we need to support more local um, production and um, domestic pro producers of organic fertilizer, incentivize them to, we need to increase education and training um, of sustainable land management practices and the need to, to quickly move away from um, synthetic fertilizer um, and start now because um, what's going on with the climate is a sure, it's a sure reason to do so. And then lastly, create communities, create networks, farming networks that appreciate what it means to grow organic, appreciate and understand um, what's happening within the climate and are empowered to locally produce even their own fertilizer for increased food production. Thank you very much. Ganz herzlichen Dank, Audrey, für diesen Thank you very much, Audrey, for this really interesting overview into your work and also your optimistic uh, words. I think for us all, this is very good to see a chance in the crisis and to have a concrete look at which alternatives already exist and how we can um, strengthen them. I would like now to begin with the questions that you have already asked. And I would still like to encourage you to note some more questions. You can put them into the Q&A tool. And if you have a question directly to Gideon or Audrey, you can mention that. And then I know who to ask the question. I will start with a short question by Mr. Reichert. How is the accessibility to organic fertilizers in Africa? Audrey already talked about the accessibility of locally produced um, fertilizers that they want to increase in Ghana. If you have some numbers for that, or maybe Gideon also has some numbers or data from other African countries where you did some research. Who would like to begin? So uh, I just wanted to ask uh, Gideon if you're still there. I can um, answer very briefly uh, to this question. It's not really my subject. I'm more uh, into economic base, but this question cannot be answered very simply for the whole continent. This would go into the wrong direction because the continent concerning agriculture is very diversified. And do we talk about um, rather peri-urban uh, spaces or rural areas? In peri-urban areas, there is a high potential to compost uh, the waste produced by the city and to have a 
uh, nutritional cycle. In rural areas, this is more difficult and a lot has to happen on the farms themselves. For example, agro uh, forest systems that are integrated can um, lead to a nutritional uh, cycle and also having some cows on the field, for example, are one way to reach this. But what we can see already is that the increasing um, culture of uh, monoculture cultures, for example, maize or rice, do uh, not support these circular systems. And sometimes they even work against uh, these systems. So we cannot give a general answer, but it is not so easy to bring organic fertilizers onto the field in Africa because uh, the situation is very diversified, but there are methods which are not um, used widely. Synthetic fertilizers are distributed in such a dominant way, and this is why it is so attractive to um, distribute this uh, technology to the field, uh, to say it like that. Audrey, would you like to add something to the question of accessibility of uh, synthetic uh, organic fertilizers? Sorry. Um, right. Um, I hope I got the question right, but with accessibility of organic fertilizer, um, I'll speak for Ghana uh, specifically because that's where um, I work. Um, it's it's on the low. Um, there's, there are a number of organic fertilizer companies that are springing up um, in order to boost, um, you know, the availability of it. But what's going on is that because um, production is under capacity um, and there's still a need for farmers to have inputs, um, um, they're opening doors for imported fertilizer to come in and most of them are synthetic. So with um, the accessibility for organic fertilizer, I'll, I'll say that um, based, on, based on the discoveries that we've made over the past four years, uh, in order to increase that, you, you need to start um, looking within farming communities and empowering them to actually start making their own to increase accessibility because um, initially imported fertilizer was cheaper than um, even ones within the local market. But with what's going on, especially in Ghana, well, the prices of imported fertilizer are, are, have skyrocketed and, and now nobody, nobody really wants to um, um, look at how they would buy it or go for it again. So now with access, with the accessibility of organic fertilizer, I think um, in order to increase that, government and, and, and local partners need to come in um, and produce more and then do those within communities that have the, the excitement and have the, the um, network to actually uh, produce and, and do that more consistently. Super, vielen Dank. Also, ich würde uh, thank you very much. So we can summarize that the potential is not yet reached for organic fertilizers in Africa. I would like to read an interesting question by David Lösche concerning the use of human excrements as fertilizers. So is this an aspect that um, is um, something that has a lot of a enough attention. So for example, the recycling of human excrements as an alternative to synthetic fertilizers. Gideon or Audrey or both of you, do you have any thoughts about this? I can say something very briefly. So first of all, fertilizing in with human excrements in the agriculture is very problematic because of certain diseases. Um, so usually people prefer using animal excrements. But because there's a, um, less access to phosphorus fertilizers, this is 
actually a topic that is increasingly discussed. There are some um, experiments going on, but this is not something that is really happening as far as I know. Uh, if you look at Kenya, Tanzania, or Zambia. Audrey, do you have any experience with that? Um, not, not personally, but I know a few um, organic fertilizer companies currently springing up in Ghana that have um, experimented with human excreta or ex excreta um, in, in, in producing organic fertilizer. They've gone through some trials and tests. Um, some did good, actually, um, based on, on reports. Um, but it's not it's not the order of the day. Um, it's not a, um, a material that is is being used um, a lot within um, Ghana's landscape, um, or even um, across across Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, vielen Dank. Um, okay, thank you very much. I can imagine that. In Germany or at the European Union, there would be a lot of hygienic regulations that um, hinder this kind of experiments. So there's a question, which um, crops are mainly fertilized with organic fertilizers and synthetic fertilizers? Are those the same crops or uh, certain crops that are better suited for organic fertilizers and other better for synthetic fertilizers, or is this uh, a difference in regions? Maybe, Audrey, you can uh, start. Sorry, Lena, can you can you take that again? Sorry. Yeah, natürlich. Um, welche... Yes, of course. So which crops? Uh, are mainly fertilized with um, synthetic fertilizer, and which crops are fertilized with organic fertilizer? Are those the same crops, or are there certain crops that are better suited for synthetic or organic fertilizers? Um, what I what I realized uh, within a, quite a number of the farming communities is that they tend to use the organic. Um, during their land preparation stage. So they would apply um, on the land um, first, and then they would move on to um, applying their synthetic for crops like maize, um, for rice, um, for okra. Um, you would also have that for high value horticultural um, um, crops like peppers, um, and the like. But organic fertilizer um, can be used for both. Um, but for synthetic, I know quite a number um, use, for, use, use, use it on rice um, and um, so on and so forth. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to add something, Gideon? Yeah. Yeah, just very briefly, this is uh, a paradoxon that we have here. So uh, basic food stuff like maize and rice require a lot of synthetic fertilizers that have to uh, be applied very broadly, but those are the crops that are not really marketed or very badly marketed so that you invest a lot into the fields but you have a high risk and not a lot of benefit a le lot less nutrients uh, are needed for um, products with a higher nutritional value like certain vegetables so actually there is a conflict of interest so where you have high quality crops, you can very well use organic fertilizers, which is something to be supported. On the other hand, you have maize fields where you have a massive appliance of um, synthetic fertilizers. So now we have strange dynamics which lead to conflict and interests. And this is where you have agricultural advisors from the fertilizing companies 
and so they invest into maize and rice etc but they talk much less about vegetables where you can apply organic fertilizers very well thank you very much this is really interesting there was one more question in the chat and concerning the demands that my colleague Lena Bassermann presented. So the fund that we propose, uh, which could be linked to the FAO to support distributing um, low priced uh, fertilizers um, and the International Fund for Rural Development, Clemens van Sand asked the following question. So they have a lot more experience in uh, structural development. So I would like to give the question to Lena. Can you say something about it? I think we uh, thought about FAO because of their strong engagement uh, in agriculture in the last years. And there is this initiative getting up ecology that is being implemented in different countries especially in Western Africa. And this is why we saw a lot of um, possibilities to link to that, um, because this is something that is supported by the FAO. But of course, this does not exclude in cooperation with other organizations, which it could be considered. Great, thank you, Lena. Are there any further questions? Otherwise, I would also have some questions ready to give you an Audrey. I saw that at the beginning, there was the question about the influence of the Food System Summit of United Nations that took place last year. Uh, so the influence on the shown tendencies. Gideon Audrey, I don't know if you are familiar with this food uh, summit in recent years. I think it was about the tendencies concerning the food crisis, the global food crisis in general. I think that uh, you from Encota are better suited to answer this, but there was a huge controversy around the food summit, uh, which was discussed. Uh, so there was a discussion about which interest groups are seated at the table, which voices are heard and which voices are not heard. So here there are some political interests at play. Um, about who uh, is heard, but I think that you know more about it. So Lena, can you add something? Yes, I would like to say something. At the UN Food System Summit, we saw that a lot of actors that were shown in our presentation and in our study, uh, some philanthropic foundations like the Rockefeller Foundation, etc., they played a role in the summit. And of course, uh, some alliances have been forged after that, so they take a role in that in order to um, further public-private relationships, etc., uh, partnerships, and to prioritize this. So at the end of the summit, there are, as a result, there were these initiatives where everyone can um, follow their own interests, but this global approach and this political answer that should be coordinated between states did not take place. And I think that the actors that are interested in maintaining the system because of their business model, their uh, strong drivers behind the summit and which uh, blocks some things. Thank you, Lena. I have a last question to both of you, Gideon and Audrey. 
I would like to know very much. So Gideon, how do you uh, regard the uh, discussion in Germany and the G7 states about the current food crisis and also um, concerning the effects of the Ukraine war on the African continent and are uh, the problems recognized enough and are they addressed enough? And Audrey, I would like to know from you, what is your perspective on politics uh, by the G7 states? And on the other hand, how does the Ghana government react to these big crises at the moment? Gideon, maybe you can start and then um, we will hear about Audrey's perspective. Yes, of course. So something uh, that we present in the media concerning the G7 summit is uh, the regret that the climate crisis seemed to be uh, in the background because apparently we have some more urgent problems which is a general problem uh, concerning a sustainable food system. And also what we can see, and the G7 organization um, represents that is a, the risk that there will be protective uh, measures concerning the G7 uh, states. Uh, and that leads to uh, disadvantages for the global south. For example, if in Europe we um, have strong subsidies for fertilizers, for example, then of course this means that globally we stabilize these high prices and African governments uh, that are highly indebted um, get under more pressure. So actually we need to find a solidary solution. And I think uh, the effects that this has have to be considered and not uh, take protect protection measures, but crises have this risk. Thank you, Gideon, for your input. Audrey, how do you um, see the debate, uh, G7 and so forth, and how are people reacting, especially in Ghana, in terms of the prices, also the prices for fertilizers? Okay. Um, I, th I think when it comes to um, uh, the food crisis um, and how, you know, the government or you know the governance the governance systems um, are approaching it. Um, I'd say it's not it doesn't have a high sense of urgency um, per my perspective and especially within farming communities they feel that the sense of urgency to tackle the the high cost of food production and um, even the distribution aspect of it doesn't come with a high sense of urgency. I think if if the political um, landscape can begin to look at um, the crisis as a human right issue, where you know it's getting to the point where we have a right to healthy food, right? And if you don't have access to that, um, you, you, um, you're not fulfilling human right obligations. They would they would approach um, approach tackling the issue with much speed, um, with much resource. Um, and, and with with much caution and care, but honestly, I don't I don't think um, I see that. Um, also, with the government um, of Ghana, I know that um, they they've been rocking with um, a fertilizer subsidy program over over the past years, um, and I think they're definitely trying, but it's definitely not extensive. And at the moment, with um, the cost of non-food commodities going up, you, you realize that um, subsidizing even more fertilizer bags um, is, is in the decline. Um, so it's hard for now, it's now hard for governments like Ghana to do this on a more consistent basis and support farmers across the regions. 
with um, farm inputs. Um, and then also, I'd say that at the moment, government or um, people on the hierarchy can't do it alone. At this point, there's a need to collaborate. There's a need to partner and be very, um, very persistent about that and say that, hey, we're going to look at private sector or local partners or people already within the local landscape or grassroots levels that are doing this, partner with them and, and be able to um, increase the efforts across board. I don't see this happening all the time, but um, at Karen, because of how the crisis is, is turning um, into a very serious issue, um, now everybody is coming on board, and uh, we hope that we can collaborate and then um, support farms and, and food security in general. Ganz herzlichen Dank, Audrey. Ich glaube, Thank you ever so much, Audrey. Uh, I think you, you've given me a perfect swag to my uh, wrap up. My final comments, thank you for this very um, to the point summary. I think today's discussion has shown that we really need uh, responses to the crisis that are coordinated on a global matter. First of all, the the urgency of this this uh, food crisis needs to be realized. If, if we really want um, a fundamental revolution and tr transition in, 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 in the food system, if we want that, as you were saying, um, the crisis should trigger this. And if we want that, we must not ignore the role of synthetic fertilizers. And this um, mantra of the fertilizer industry that synthetic fertilizers are um, just um, necessary, that needs to be questioned. And as Gideon was said, saying the climate crisis must not be ignored either so the different crises climate crisis pricing crisis food crisis uh, biodiversity crisis all these need to be um, analyzed together and then we need to find structural responses structural actions these are not easy questions or challenges i look forward to a lot more exciting discussions i hope that with our ecota study we've been able to provide a contribution to this in debate uh, there was a question in the chat we are also going to publish the study report in english so far it's only available in german available to download from the ecota web shop i think my colleague will put the link in the chat again and of course, we'd be over the moon if you could read the report, um, cascade it further. And I'd like to thank uh, Gideon Tups now, my colleague Lena Bassermann and Audrey Darko. Thank it was you. It was great to have you on board. It was great to listen to your input um, and your contributions. Thank you to everybody for listening as well and for asking excellent questions. And I'd like to wish everybody a pleasant evening.